Today we want to look at the purpose of Christmas and discover what's so special about Christmas. Actually, I could sum up the purpose and why we celebrate Christmas in three words. God came down. Think about that a moment. The God of the universe put on an earth suit and he took up residence with the creatures that he had created. He did this in bodily form of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.15 says, Jesus Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. He existed before God made anything at all. In fact, Christ himself is the creator who made everything. Did you hear that? It is extremely hard for us to comprehend it. According to this scripture, Jesus Christ is the creator who made everything. So Jesus, the God-man, he didn't start in a stable in the city of Bethlehem. His beginning was not that little manger scene that we see in the Bible. He actually existed before the creation of the world. Here are a couple of scriptures to prove he existed before the world was created. One is from the Old Testament. One is from the New Testament. Isaiah 48 and 13 says, My hand laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. And then in the New Testament, Hebrews 1.10, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. So therefore, if we could create worlds, he, if he could create worlds, he certainly could create us. That's right. Jesus Christ made us, that little baby, as the word in the beginning and has his effect in every one of our makeup for, you know, a husband and a wife may have a child, but actually that child is actually coming from the decision of Almighty God. God just uses the parents to give birth to us. We're all God-breathed and continue to live by God's grace. There's a phrase that says, like father, like son. <clears throat> That's true with God. If you've seen Jesus Christ in the Bible, then you've seen God. Because Jesus told Philip, he said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2, 7, he, talking about God, became like men and was born a human being. Now, I, know about, I don't know about you, but if I'd have been God, I would not have done it that way. I would have come to earth in a more spectacular way. I would have added a little pizzazz and flash to my appearance. I would have planned my coming at halftime during the Super Bowl when the entire world was watching with lots of fireworks and dazzling lights to the sound of the biggest band. I would have had all the leaders of the world lined up on the 50-yard line waiting to give me a billion dollars worth of gifts when I arrived if I had been God. But God had a better idea. His idea was this. He would come into the world the same way that everybody else comes into the world by being born into it. God, who created the universe, would humble and limit himself by coming down to earth in human form and being born in the normal, natural way. And not only that, but amazingly, he would be born of extremely poor parents in a stable in a little tiny village. It is inconceivable to my understanding that God's entire plan for the world was wrapped up in that fragile little baby. Look at that picture of that little baby in the feeding trough. Think of all the things that could have gone wrong but didn't. When I've held my little grandchildren in my hands, I thought how helpless and totally dependent they are on their parents and their grandparents to take care of them. They have to be fed and bathed and their diapers have to be changed because they're helpless. They can't take care of themselves. They totally depend upon us for love. And then I think of God. Why would God come that way? Of all the ways that God could have come to earth, why did he come as a little baby? Well, here's the reason. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not to scare us. Nobody's afraid of a little baby. God could have come to earth in a lot of ways, and that would have scared the living daylights out of us and made us run in terror. But he didn't do that. His next coming will be like that when he comes. He's going to bring judgment to the world, but the first time he came to save us. 
The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was in every sense a human being. When he came to earth, he limited himself so that he could become both God and man at the, at the same time. You might say, well, what does that mean to me? What it means is this. He understands how you feel. God says, I've been wherever you have been. I'm not some distant God who doesn't understand what you're going through. I've been there. I've came to earth and I've experienced what it means to be a human. But in all actuality, he did not just become human so he could experience what we feel. He really came to save us. I used to love listening to Paul Harvey and he has a great rendition on telling us how that uh, an experience that he had of how God came into the world. And listen to us called The Man and the Birds. Let me tell you a story about a man, a good man, a family man. Oh, he was not a Scrooge. He was kind, generous, and upright in his dealings with others. But he just didn't believe all that incarnation stuff which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just didn't make sense, and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He just couldn't swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. I'm truly sorry to distress you, he told his wife, but I'm not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay at home, but that he would wait up for them. Shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. As he sat in his fireside chair and read the newspaper, he was startled by a thudding sound, and then another, and then another. At first he thought someone must be throwing snowballs against the house, but when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled miserably in the snow. They had been caught in the storm and in a desperate search for shelter had tried to fly through his living room window. Well, he couldn't let those poor creatures just lie there and freeze, so he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes and tramped through the deepening snow to the barn. He opened the doors wide and turned on a light so the birds would know the way in. But the birds did not come in. He figured food would entice them, so he hurried back to the house, fetched breadcrumbs, and sprinkled them on the snow, making a trail to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs. He tried catching them. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them and waving his arms, but instead they scattered in every direction except into the warm, lighted barn. And then he realized they were afraid of him. To them, he reasoned, I'm a strange and terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me, that I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? And he thought to himself, if only I could be a bird and talk to them and mingle with them and speak their language and tell them not to be afraid, then I could show them the way to the safe, warm barn. But I would have to be one of them so they could see and hear and understand. At that moment, the church bells began to ring. The sound reached his ears above the sounds of the wind, and he stood there, listening to the bells, pealing the glad tidings of Christmas. And he sank to his knees in the snow. So you can see, 
What we and billions of other people celebrate on Christmas is not just the birth of some average, normal baby. The baby that was born in Bethlehem's manger was God in human form. The blood that flowed in his veins was royal blood. It was the blood of God. Therefore, it was sinless. His blood came from his heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit, he was 100% human, and he was also 100% divine. How? His mother Mary was human. His father was God. He was divine. So why did God come to earth? Well, God came to earth to show us what he was really like. There was a lot of, there's a lot of stupid, crazy ideas about God that just not true. That's why God gave us the Bible, so we would have no questions as to who he was. The only thing some people know about God is what they see in nature. And it's true that you can go up into the mountains or you can go over to the coast or just outside and you can learn some things about God. For instance, by looking at nature, we can know that God is creative. By looking at nature, we know God is powerful. Obviously, the waves, the wind, the rotation of the earth, all the power of God that's seen in the universe. By looking at nature, we know that God is organized because there is order to the universe. By looking at nature, we know that God likes variety because there's a lot of variety in the world. We know that God likes beauty. Look at his creation in its pristine state. And we certainly know he has a sense of humor. All we have to do is look at one another. <laughs> but the most important things that you can ever learn about God can only be found in knowing Jesus Christ. If you really want to know God, you will have to see him in the face of Jesus Christ, the Word. The Bible is how you see and get to know God. For instance, nature doesn't teach us that God is love. We only know that because of what we see in the Word. Nature doesn't teach us that God is forgiving. We only know because of Jesus Christ, the Word. Nature doesn't teach us that God has a plan for our lives, that we are not just an accident, that he put us on this earth for a purpose and for a reason. Only Jesus Christ can teach us that. Jesus is the only one that lets us know what God is really like. Secondly, God came to earth to show us what life should be like. He wanted to show us how to really live. One of the most famous statements that was ever made was made by Jesus where he said, a thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. But I came so that they have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Jesus didn't say, I've come to give you a religion or I've come to make you religious. He said, I have come to make you fully alive, to teach you the kind of life that God puts you on this earth to live. And until you get connected with your creator, you're not going to live that kind of life the life that is full, the life that you only dreamed of having. You're just going to exist. Another reason that God came to earth was God came to earth to forgive everything we've ever done wrong so that we can go to a perfect place called heaven when we die. I don't know about you, but that's a wonderful feeling. First John 3, 5 says, He became a man so that he could take away our sins. There's the purpose for Christmas. He became a man that he could take away our sins. Philippians 2, 6, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on a cross. You see, Jesus came to earth to die for all the things that we've done wrong so we don't have to pay for them so that we can be forgiven and we can be set free. God sacrificed a lot to do this for us. He left his eternal throne, his home in glory, and then he limited himself and he became a human being. He put up with all the aches and the pains and the sufferings that we go through. Yet he was God. He gave up his life for our life. He died on the cross. Jesus didn't stay in the manger. He grew up. He went to the cross and he died for us. Why in the world would he do that? Why in the world would God come to earth in human form and die for us? Well, I'll tell you why. 
He loves us. He loves us more than we will ever understand. We can't begin to fathom how much God loves us. Paul said in Ephesians, the love of God is incomprehensible. It surpasses our human knowledge. We cannot understand it because our brain isn't big enough. You trying to understand God's love is like an ant trying to understand us. They don't have the capacity. Neither do we have the capacity to understand God. No one will ever love us as much as God does. I love the old psalm that says, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made? If every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a tribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Praise God. First John 4, 9. God showed how much he loves us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love that God sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. The Bible says the greatest love a person can ever have is when they are willing to give their life for somebody else. John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus Christ laid down his life for you when you were not his friend. Why did he do it? I'm going to tell you why. He took a chance, a chance that he could convince you during your lifetime to be his friend. He started the process, and now it's up to us to complete it. He's our friend before we ever knew him. But now that we do, it's time for us to be his friend. In fact, before we ever knew him, before we were ever born, when we were going the opposite direction, headed in the wrong way, God still gave his life for us. Romans 5, 7, For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's wonderful. Jesus is the reason for the season. I know you've probably seen those stickers on mailboxes, refrigerators, and a whole lot of other places at Christmas time. They say Jesus is the reason for the season. And that is true. Jesus is the reason for the season. Christmas is not about Santa Claus. It's about a Savior. It's not about jingle bells. It's about Jesus. I believe Satan has a stealth plan to sway the people of this world away from Jesus by promoting Satan to sainthood. In fact, they've already given him the name, Old Saint Nick. But believe me, Jesus is better than Santa Claus. I'll show you why. Satan lives only at the North Pole. Jesus is everywhere. Santa lies, rides in a sleigh. Jesus rides on the wind and walks on the water. Santa comes but once a year. Jesus is an ever-present help. Santa lives on your, fills your stockings with goodies, but Jesus supplies all your needs. Santa comes down your chimney uninvited, but Jesus stands at your door and knocks, and then he only enters when your heart invites him in. You have to wait in line to see Santa. Jesus is as close as the mention of his name. Santa lets you sit on his lap, but Jesus lets you rest in his arms. Santa doesn't know your name. All he can say is, hi, little boy or girl, what's your name? But Jesus knew your name before you knew your name. Not only does he know your name, but he also knows your address. He knows your history. He knows your future. He even knows how many hairs are on your head. Santa has a belly like a bowl full of jelly, but Jesus has a heart full of love. All Satan can offer is Ho, ho, ho. But Jesus offers help, help, and hope. Santa says, you better not cry. And Jesus says, cast all your cares on me, for I care for you. In fact, I care so much that I have all your tears saved up in a bottle. Santa, Santa's little helpers, they make toys, but Jesus makes new life. Men's wounded hearts, repairs broken homes, builds mansions. Santa may make you chuckle, but Jesus gives you joy 
that is your strength. While Santa puts gifts under the tree, Jesus became our gift and died on a tree that he had made. It's obvious there is really no comparison. We need to remember who Christmas is all about. In fact, we need to put Christ back in Christmas. Jesus is still the reason for the season, and that's why we celebrate Christmas. But let's go a little bit deeper today and try to understand why God came down. We are the reason for the season. If God hadn't known that we needed him to come to earth and die for us, he wouldn't have come. If we didn't need what Jesus had to offer, he wouldn't have wasted his time. You are a reason for the season. You are the reason we celebrate Christmas. It's God's Christmas gift to you. Now, my question to you is, what are you getting Christ for Christmas? There really is only one thing that Jesus wants, and he wants you. The, significant, the significance of Christmas is this. God came to earth as a human being for our benefit so that we could have a relationship with him forever. We can know God personally. We can have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. God knows everything about us. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. He wants us to know everything about him. And when we do, we'll find out that he's precious, he's lovely, and he's holy. He wants us to be his friend. He wants to be our friend. He wants us to be his friend. In fact, this is the reason we were created. The reason he put us on earth was to have a relationship with God, or in other words, to be a friend of God. If we miss that, we've blown the whole reason for our whole life, to get to know God on a personal basis. That is the gift of Christmas. He said, I want you to know me like I know you, but first you must receive the gift if it's going to make any difference in your life. Romans 5.10, we are restored to friendship with God by the death of his son. While we were still his enemies, and we will be delivered from the eternal punishment by his life. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. This is the most wonderful gift you can ever be given, the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing compares. This Christmas, you'll probably open a bunch of gifts that you don't even need. Some of those gifts are going to be impersonal. Some of them are going to be impractical. You really can't use them. Some of them are going to be temporary. They're going to wear out. They're going to break. Some of them are back, going to be flat out cheap, and others will simply be for regifting. But none of those things apply to God's gift to you. God's gift is personal. It's priceless, and it's permanent. It was custom made for you. Luke 2.11, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So this gift is personal. He would have come as a Savior if you were the only human being alive. This gift is priceless. Jesus Christ paid for it with his life. That's how much it costs to pay for this gift. This gift is permanent. It will last forever throughout eternity. So what where are you going to get this where are you going to get a gift like that? Nowhere except from God. If I told you that I have a gift for you and that gift will solve all your biggest problems, heal all your deepest hurts, forgive every single mistake that you've ever made, help you understand the purpose you are put on this earth and make you a better person, and fill your life with confidence and joy and peace, and eternally secure your future in heaven, would you be interested in a gift like that? I think so. When you fully understand how wonderful this gift is, how incredible, how magnificent, how marvelous, how mind-blowing God's gift of love through Jesus Christ is to you, then I believe that you want to accept it and commit your life to serve him. How do you do that? How do you open God's gift of love and become his friend? Well, it's pretty simple. It's like, it says, if you use your mouth to say Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. So we believe with our hearts 
And so we are made right with God. And we use our mouths to say that we believe and so we are saved. You say, well, Jesus is my Lord. What does that mean? What does it mean to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Well, remember in school they told you that you got to know your ABCs? Well, knowing Christ is as simple as knowing your ABCs. A, admit that he is God and you're not. B, believe that he loves you and give him control over your life. When he's in control, he can take even the bad things in your life and turn them around and bring out the good in them and let him be the one that tells, gives you the, the instructions on what you should do in your life. And then commit to him the rest of your life to follow his plan and do what he wants you to do. Every once in a while, you will be going down the street and you'll see a sign out in front of a store and the sign will say, under new management. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. You put out a new sign that says, I'm under new management. Jesus Christ is now the manager of my life. He is the Lord. He's calling the shots. I'm not calling the shots anymore. He made me. He loves me. He knows what's best. So I'm going to follow his plan that I was put on this earth to do. Why should I do that? Well, two reasons. One, he made me. And number two, he loved me enough to come and die for me and take away all my sins. Nobody else ever did that for me. I think I owe my life to him. So let's wrap up this lesson with this powerful scripture. Philippians, Philippians 2 and 9 through 11 says, For this reason, God gave Jesus the name that is greater than any other name. One day all beings in heaven and on earth and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. I think that scripture is remarkable. You probably never thought of it this way before, but God sent Jesus Christ, the one and only son, to not only save us, but to bring glory to himself. Even the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit glory and glorify God, the creator of everything. Don't you think we should get in on that? We should all be glorifying God with praise and worship. How do you do that? Well, the Bible says the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such to be his worshipers. Occasionally you'll hear people say, what is this world coming to? Well, I'll tell you what it's coming to. It's coming to an end very soon. I don't know when, but it's going to end. And the Bible says that one day everybody that's ever lived is going to stand before God on the day of accountability, on the day of reckoning, the day of judgment. And everyone will be there. Every nation, every ethnic group, every language, every religion, every age group, every person who has ever lived will be there. And the Bible says that every knee will bow and everyone there is going to openly admit what has been the truth for centuries and for eternity and that Jesus is Lord. It will be too late for some people, but everyone's going to admit that Jesus is Lord. Every politician is going to be there. Every businessman will be there. Every rock star, every athlete, every homemaker, entrepreneurs are going to be there on their knees saying Jesus is Lord. We're all going to admit it, admit it one day. All the denials will be over. All the arrogance will be gone. Adolf Hitler will be in that crowd. He will be on his knees saying Jesus is Lord. Karl Marx will be there with all the billions of others on their knees saying Jesus is Lord. Every president, every king, everyone, everybody, I think I've been pretty much included everyone is going to be there saying Jesus is Lord. Think about this for a moment. God gave up his only begotten son rather than give up on humanity. Grace cost nothing for the recipients, but everything for the giver. God's grace is not some grandfatherly display of niceness. It costs the exorbitant price of Calvary. There's only one real law of the heavenly, and that is everything there in the heavens must be holy. God demands holiness. The opposite of holiness is sin, and therefore sin demands justice. Because God is holy, and nothing unholy shall ever please God or go to heaven. Sin cannot enter heaven. Sin and rebellion must be paid for. 
It may be fulfilled either by way of judgment or by the way of grace, but it must be paid for one way or the other. God, in his unfathomable wisdom, found a way to justify the demands for holiness. He came down to earth in bodily form. He accepted the judgment in his own body. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law of justice when he cried out on the cross, it is finished or paid in full. God found a way to forgive. God found a way to remove our Adamic sin. And God found a way to allow us into his heaven. The issue is not whether we are going to admit that Jesus is Lord, because we're all going to admit it. The issue is not if, it's a matter of when, either now or later. Either you admit it now and accept his gift of love, or later admit it in regret as you face your judgment. So why would you wait? Why would you not accept that love, that kind of love? that kind of purpose that God has created you for, and say this Christmas, I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. I want to make this the merriest Christmas that I've ever ever, ever experienced. God bless you. We love you. We hope we've been a blessing to you this Christmas. God bless you.